And welcome back to State of the World 2021. I'm David Kramer with the Green School of International and Public Affairs here at Florida International University. And thanks very much for either rejoining us or joining us for the first time. Um, we are thrilled with uh, our next session, which features a conversation with former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. And to lead us in that conversation is a very good friend of mine, Ambassador Mark Green, who is the Executive Director of the McCain Institute, our partner in this conference. And he will soon become the new President and CEO of the Woodrow Wilson Center in DC. Mark has had a very distinguished career in government, serving as ambassador to Tanzania and as a member of Congress from Wisconsin, as well as the administrator of the US Agency for International Development. He also served as president of the International Republican Institute. So Mark, it's my pleasure to turn it over to you for the conversation with Secretary Albright. Great, uh, thanks David, good to be with you. Thanks for those kind words and uh, good to be with all of you. Uh, so the theme of this conference is the struggle for democracy. Well, there are few people more passionate about democracy than Madeleine Albright. From her childhood in war-torn Europe to her tenure as Secretary of State to her long-standing role as chair of the National Democratic Institute, I think it's safe to say that democracy, freedom, human rights are always close to her heart and uh, close to her voice. Now, you have in your programs a brief bio. I won't run through an extended bio for a few reasons. Number one, it is so rich and varied that it would literally take all of our time today. And uh, secondly, the second reason is it keeps changing. Uh, I think it's fair to say that Secretary Albright is uh, relentless and uh, restless in terms of opining on the challenges of the day. And uh, that makes her an especially important guest for us today. So uh, Secretary Albright, uh, welcome. And it's great to be with you as always. It's my pleasure, Mark. And I look forward to this. And I also am very pleased with your next assignment um, at the Woodrow Wilson Center. I was a fellow in the 80s. Uh, and uh, I think it's terrific. And I keep following you around. So I'm delighted that we'll have a chance uh, to keep talking about all these things. Pleasure to be with you. Great, thank you. Always good to be with you. Uh, so as uh, I believe you know, at the McCain Institute, we're starting a new podcast that we call Three Bits of Advice. And the notion is a simple one. President Biden, when he was candidate Biden, said many times that he wanted to be a president, not just for Democrats, not just for people who voted for him, but for all Americans. And so we're taking him up on that. And we're asking the thoughtful and the opinionated that we bump into in case they bump into him, whether it be on that train from DC to Delaware, although I think that's rather unlikely these days, or bumping into him in one of his old Senate haunts. If you had 10 minutes with Joe Biden undivided, what are three bits of advice that you would offer to him as he leads this country forward? Well, thank you very much. And I uh, would welcome 10 minutes to talk about this. Um, I do think that he has a very large agenda that he has to fulfill. And so uh, my first advice is to do what he talked about in his inaugural uh, address in terms of unifying the country, which requires uh, his really spending time explaining and talking and, and listening, that combination. But he knows how to do that. But I think really the unifying aspect of it is very important. I also, in that respect, the second piece of advice is to make clear to people how domestic and foreign policy go together. Uh, because in explaining what needs to be done, I think in a democracy, you need to have the people be able to understand what is happening and the connection between the two. Because um, as you know, Mark, there is a division in many ways between the people that talk foreign policy and those who talk <clears throat> domestic policy, and it's wrong. It's a false dichotomy. And I think that there's nobody better to talk about that than President Biden, but it has to be uh, in his mind at all times. And then I think the third piece does have to do with what we're talking about here, which is democracy. And uh, I, 
as I was introduced, I clearly have uh, escaped to, from a variety of places with my family in order to be able to be um, a, a participant and a recipient of the greatness of democracy. And I do think that it needs to be emphasized more in our national security policy. But in order to do that, we have been, and, and uh, uh, both as vice president and as president, uh, Biden had said that we need to operate by the, by the power of our example and not just the example of our power. And at this moment, there are genuine questions about how American democracy is working. So in fact, uh, this is the third piece of advice, which fits with the others, is that we have to do everything we can to repair our democracy and understand what the problems are, because we can't be a leader in the world about really uh, projecting democracy and uh, the power of our example unless we do those things. So uh, unify, uh, understand that, dem that domestic and foreign policy go together, promote democracy, and in the process of that, be able to fix whatever issues that we're having now. So the, the pieces of advice all actually fit together. Uh, and I'm very happy to discuss them at more length, but I, they are focused on a very similar aspect, which is unify and listen to people so that you know what you're doing when you lead. And, and boy, that fits in so well with our theme for today. Um, in your career and the work that you did, whether it be uh, ambassador to the UN or secretary of state, uh, you were a, a warrior for democracy and really began what's become the community of democracies. Uh, President Biden, again, candidate Biden, talked a great deal about having either a summit or an alliance of democracies upon taking office. Still a good idea? And how does that differ from uh, what you had launched, what you had proposed and launched a few years back? I think it is a good idea, but if I had more time in giving him advice about this, I would say it's more difficult than it seems. Uh, so let me give a little bit of background on the community of democracies. Uh, it was something that I wanted to do when I was Secretary of State, and I actually, with the help of Bronislav Goremek, who, by the way, Mark, was a fellow at the Wilson Center. Um, and, uh, and so he was foreign minister at the time as I was secretary. And uh, he wanted to attach Warsaw as an adjective to something other than the pact. He wanted it to be the Warsaw Declaration um, in terms of what came out of this idea of the community of democracies. And we had a meeting, the problem, and I do think this is something that will also face those that are working on it for the Biden administration, is whom do you invite? Uh, and uh, how do you define it? And do you have everybody or do you have a small group or do you uh, uh, begin with one group and expand to another? And I do think that that's one of the things that has to be looked at very carefully. The purpose of the community of democracies is something that continues, I think, to be, or should be a purpose for what the Biden people are talking about is how to share best practices. What is it we learn from each other? Uh, what are the issues that have to be dealt with? Uh, how do we help each other? And how it's not just an American idea, but that you have partners. And we um, had a series of countries that were also kind of co-chairs um, and the various gatherings that we had over the years took place in their countries. And we were able to see how they were dealing with issues. So I'm all for it. Uh, I do think that there were lessons learned. I do think the questions will continue to be, whom do you invite? Um, do, is there any one model? There isn't democracy um, and how we listen to how others do democracy and then try to figure out an action plan that takes it step by step. But I'm very glad that it is a front and center. One of the things I'm often asked are kind of what are the various goals of American policy? And this has been said by others, but it's diplomacy, defense, development, and the fourth D, democracy, that has to be brought forward because it what makes possible the other three. So let me ask you this, and, and I agree with everything that you've said. Uh, we've obviously uh, seen our challenges here at home. 
uh, including the siege of the Capitol, uh, the insurrectionist. Um, do we have to get our democracy uh, polished up a little bit before we have an alliance or a summit of democracies? I think it has to be uh, done together because I think that one of the things about democracy that I think is very important is there are two aspects of it. One, it's fragile, but it is also resilient. And it has within it the possibilities of self-correction. And we, uh, and it's never, I mean, these are all cliches that people use, they just happen to be true. It's never all done, it is a journey. Um, and it is something that you know for your work with the International Republican Institute and me with the, the Democrats, that uh, we explain that American democracy is not the only democracy, but in fact, that it is something that uh, takes place over time and is a journey and is self-correcting. The other part that I have believed about democracy is that democracy has to deliver. Uh, and I think that's a very important part I, in my uh, kind of uh, slogan way, I say, because people want to vote and eat. And therefore, there have to be ways that democracy satisfies the economic, political uh, needs of the people uh, so that they know what's going on, are in a position to make decisions there. So there are various characteristics to democracy that suit uh, uh, repair work very well, and you don't have to wait until it's totally done. It's the journey that actually is a good lesson also. So for the, everyone who is tuned in today, uh, I'm going to hog my time with the sector for about another 15 minutes, and then we hope to hear from all of you uh, with questions that you bring forward. Um, Madeline, something that you've done that I think is really important and doesn't get done enough and that is uh, talking about how domestic policy and foreign policy need to be integrated, that it isn't one or the other, that it is part of the overall American purpose to work on both at the same time. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, one thing that has always impressed me about your career and your work is it's never ending. Every time I uh, open up the newspaper, open up a magazine, uh, there's a new message from you, always timely and always forward looking. Back uh, just a week ago, two weeks ago, you know, very interesting op ed in Time magazine. And I wanted to read a couple of paragraphs from it and get some reaction from you. You said, or you wrote, many citizens are tempted either to retreat more deeply into their respective group identities or to insist piously that such categories are irrelevant and should not matter. Neither approach works. Exacerbating our differences as Americans is one road to disaster. Denying them is another. Instead of fantasizing about a harmony that is out of reach, we should focus on ensuring that our inevitable disagreements lead wherever possible to constructive outcomes. Now, um, President Biden has spoken many times about the importance of unity. Uh, he doesn't mean though, uh, unity as uh, everyone necessarily holding every single piece of the same view. In other words, when he says unity, he means more uh, unity of purpose, broad-based purpose and constructive disagreement along the way. Don't you think? I do. I think that what makes a democracy so fantastic is the possibility of expressing different ideas and seeing how they can lead. We're, we're problem solvers and there isn't just somebody that can do it all by themselves or by order. And so having a variety of ideas um, and a plans is a very good idea, a very good thing to do. I begin that um, op-ed with saying that the two most dangerous words are us and them. Uh, the division of society. And there are divisions in every society for some reason or another. What is bad is when you have a leader who exacerbates the divisions. The thing in terms of unity, I think it means uh, in the following way to respect other people's ideas. Not to, uh, you're going to think this is strange, but I don't like the word uh, tolerance because it's tolerate, put up with. It's more than that. It's respecting and trying to figure out where their ideas come from and having 
discussions about it and trying to figure out uh, what the purpose is, how we operate, but it is a respect for other ideas and not to make the divisions worse. Um, and then really understand that one of the things that make democracies work is what we call the social contract. Uh, people gave up some of their individual rights in order to be protected by the state. The problem is that what has happened recently is neither side has fulfilled its part of the contract. The governments in terms of what their responsibilities are and the people as to whether they really uh, participate, vote, understand what the issues are, and then come up with a solution um, and a way of operating that recognizes the differences but are able to function together to achieve something better. So as a reminder to our audience, I'm gonna be turning to you for questions in a few moments. Um, Madeline, the last time we spoke, which was last fall, uh, we were talking about your uh, marvelous book, uh, Hell and Other Destinations, uh, which comes on the heels of fascism, a warning. We, we note a trend there, a theme of concerns that you have about the state of American politics and the state of American leadership. But I look at the last six months, which includes the time since we last spoke, we've seen uh, flyovers over Taiwan, continued protests in Belarus, uh, the poisoning and then the arrest of Navalny. Uh, sadly, just in the last hours, a military coup in Burma, Myanmar. And of course, uh, we can't possibly look beyond the siege of the US Capitol. And yet, every time I talk with you, you're optimistic. Why are you optimistic, given all that I just laid out? You know, recently, Mark, I was at a dinner and I was supposed to describe myself in six words. So I said, worried optimist, problem solver, grateful American. And they really do go together. I am an optimist. But I worry that uh, we uh, miss some signals that we uh, kind of think, well, that'll pass without any activity or action. But problem solving is the issue. And I think that uh, there, <clears throat> the things that you've mentioned are just a few of the problems because there are many others and obviously COVID and the economy and global warming and various aspects. <clears throat> but it, uh, and my book, Hell and Other Destinations is really an attempt to show, it's a little bit of a rationalization of all the things I do to prove that they all go together. But they, and they do because one informs the other and I learn how various parts work. Um, but I do think that problem solving is important and I never forget that I'm a grateful American. I'm a refugee. And um, the fact that I was able to grow up as a free American and understand what um, the possibilities and the greatness that we have in terms of being able to work with each other to solve the problem. So I do think there's a lot to do. I think that um, in the Biden administration, we are seeing the, um, the really great desire and uh, goal of solving some of the problems, but also, and I've just taught about this today, Mark, I teach at Georgetown in a course um, on the National Security Toolbox. And I was talking about the decision-making process, which in the United States is so based on executive legislative relations working. And again, you're an example of having done that and then look at various other parts. And, and I think that is a part that is absolutely essential uh, in terms of respect for the other branch, understanding how it operates and then explaining it to the American people. So we have the tools to solve the problems. We just have to apply ourselves and not just look for uh, the kinds of things that divide us. By the way, the best quote in my fascism book came from Mussolini, who said, if you pluck a chicken one feather at a time, nobody notices. Uh, there has been a lot of feather plucking. We have to stop the feather plucking um, and try to figure out how to solve the problems. You know, something that um, I've said to a few people and, and may not be um, popular in today's politics, that I think uh, training or experience as a Hill staffer or a member of Congress is an extraordinarily important preparation for diplomacy and leadership. 
because to be successful as a legislator or legislative staff, you have to understand who you're working with, where they come from, what they can do and what they can't do. Uh, I have to believe that that experience will serve President Biden well. I, I'm sure it will, because in addition to that, it gives you that capability of understanding how domestic and foreign policy do go together, to understand the district that you come from. And frankly, by the way, compromise is not a four letter word. Um, it is something that is essential in democracy. Um, and I think that people that um, either have been the representatives or their staffers on the Hill understand. And, and I, I worked for Senator Edmund Muskie and, and I loved the kind of meetings that we had with um, the other party and trying to solve different things. And then when we, and then I went from working for Ed Muskie to do congressional relations in the Carter White House. So the bottom line is trying to work those two areas together uh, executive legislative relations and understanding what the um, the roots of the issues are and how you deal with them. And uh, literally compromise is not a bad word. I'm going to switch gears on you. Uh, so uh, I mentioned just very quickly in passing some of the democracy movements and the skirmishes that we've seen just in the last six months. Uh, from your standpoint, how do you think technology has made these challenges worse? Or maybe another way of looking at it, how do you see technology as a potential tool towards addressing them and making them better? You know, Mark, sometimes I talk about megatrends and one that I talk and their downside. So technology has clearly been unbelievable in many ways. And I always like to talk about the Kenyan woman farmer who no longer has to walk hundreds of miles a year to pay her bills. She can just do it over her, um, her mobile phone. And it allows her then to participate um, in, uh, at NDI, we urge women to run for office and, um, or uh, have a business. That's the positive part. And it has connected people in a way that is stunning. It's negative part is what we saw in the Arab Spring where people were motivated by social media to go to Tahrir Square in Cairo and demonstrate, but they had no idea what information had gotten them there, what the role of the social media was and how it operates and uh, what, what was true and what was false. Um, and what I always make up this, uh, uh, and by the way, I rarely say this, but elections in Egypt were held too soon so that the people in Tahrir Square did not know uh, what they wanted. Um, and so I make up this middle-aged guy who lives in outside of Cairo, who wants to come to open his, uh, into the city to open up his uh, stall in the marketplace. And the place is a total mess. And he says, to hell with this, I want order. And then they have a military government. And so that's the downside of technology that just, you don't know where you're getting the information the whole role of the way social media is playing. But I think on the whole, uh, the developments in technology can and should be turned into a positive aspect for what is definitely gonna be a new era where technology is gonna play a huge part in our daily lives. You know, it's interesting. Um, I agree with how you've, you've described that. I think another interesting uh, evolution, if you will, in democracy and development is the greater uh, economic interest that the U.S. has in so many parts of the world, because then you also have business investment, the kinds of business investment that can help us collaborate so democracy delivers. So it, it, as you said, democracy has to help put food on the table if it's going to be relevant in many of these places in the world. I think very much. And and I think, by the way, I have argued for a long time that the private sector has to have a role in international or national security decision making because the public sector, the businesses have to help. We couldn't be dealing with the virus if the private companies weren't creating the vaccine. And so there has to be developed a way that there can be more cooperation in terms of the things that need to be done um, and a way of understanding how they fit together. And so 
Um, I think that there is an awful lot of work to do in terms of broadening the participation and the problem solving part of this. And by the way, I do think that one of the things that is important is trying to figure out what the role of information in democracy is generally. Uh, by the way, I wrote my dissertation, I believe in the role of information and political change. And so I wrote my dissertation on the um, Czechoslovak press in 1968. And while I was a fellow at the Wilson Center, I wrote, I wrote uh, a whole set of uh, articles about the role of solidarity and the press and the role of micro cassettes in spreading information. And um, so that's the, I believe in that. And we now have to figure out how to link the information flow to what it is that we're trying to do so that it's a positive and not a negative uh, aspect of it. Okay, we're gonna turn to some audience questions, but as I uh, take a look at the, uh, the chat box, uh, you have called uh, being Secretary of State the greatest job in the world. Still think so? Absolutely. I, I loved every minute of it. Uh, and who would have thought? Uh, and, and it was a great time in terms of possibilities of doing things. And, and I always say, I was afraid they were gonna have to drag me out by my heels to, to leave, but I think it is a great job. Um, and it's very important when it works within the national security system of how the Secretary of State works with the other cabinet members uh, and the White House and the NSC. So, so absolutely, I do think it, it uh, was a great job. Um, and I wish Tony Blinken the very best uh, because there's nothing better than sitting behind a sign that says the United States. And so, um, you know, to put together a couple of things, I am an immigrant. I came here when I was 11 years old. And one of the things I love doing more than anything else is giving people their naturalization certificates. And so the first time I did it was um, July 4th, 2000 at Monticello. I figured since I had Thomas Jefferson's job, I could use his house to do that. And I gave this man his naturalization certificate and he's walking away and he said, can you believe it? I'm a refugee and I just got my naturalization certificate from the secretary of state. And I found him and I went up to him and I said, can you believe that a refugee is secretary of state? And so to sit behind the sign of the United States and be the secretary of state was the greatest honor of my life. So uh, tell us a little bit more if you will about uh... Uh, the new secretary, Tony Blinken, um, how do you think he will lead and what do you think his priorities either are or should be or both? Well, first of all, I think that uh, one of the things that's important and, I, and literally um, I was teaching about this, that it's very important to understand where people, what their background and way of thinking is and, and what are their experiences have been. And Tony Blinken, uh, has a very interesting background in terms of a lot of relatives that have been came out of Europe and many of them diplomats, but he also uh, worked on the Hill. So he understands the importance of, of the legislative branch and how it operates. He's been very close to President Biden through the various roles. Uh, he has worked at the State Department before and he, and by the way, I think one of the things that's going to be very good about this administration is the, um, the relationships that many of the people within it uh, have uh, developed over the years and they know how to operate together. I think he has um, a broad vision of what needs to be done. Um, I wasn't able to watch his whole confirmation hearing, but I do think his opening statement and ways of seeing the goals for America, understanding the importance of democracy uh, and the importance of diplomacy and developing the various diplomatic tools that uh, one has um, uh, charge of when you're secretary of state. And, and really what I also like is that he was, has been talking a lot and I watched him um, when he welcomed, when he went to the state department, uh, the need to uh, really refurbish the, the State Department in terms of people. A lot of people left, uh, a lot of people were asked to leave. And one of the things that, and again, uh, a couple of years ago, some of my students at Georgetown said, well, I don't wanna take the foreign service exam because I don't 
agree with what's going on. Uh, they now, I've just had met with some of them, they're eager to go work at the department and that new generation that understands technology that wants to be a part of a, of a new era. So, and I think Tony's gonna be an absolutely terrific leader for that. He has a vision, he works very well with people um, and he has a historical background in terms of when America doesn't lead and things go badly as they did for some members of his family during World War II. We have our first question that comes from Vilnius. Um, the question is, was it a mistake for us, us being the US, to not continue on with NATO enlargement and the push for expanding NATO? Uh, it's interesting because usually uh, I am criticized for having expanded NATO. Uh, and I, uh, I actually think that expanding NATO was very important because in fact, uh, the line drawn through the middle of Europe after the end of World War II uh, was something that affected millions of people. Um, and, and NATO really came out of the fact that um, there, and I, I take everything personally, uh, that there wasn't enough attention paid to what was happening in Central and Eastern Europe immediately after the war. And right after the Czechoslovak communist coup in February, 1948, was when really movement toward expand, uh, creating NATO happened. And NATO is not only the most powerful alliance in the history of the world, but it is also an alliance of democratic states. So I'm, I'm very proud of the expansion that we did. I think that it has expanded systematically, but I think one of the issues that has to be kept in mind is that um, uh, even we said this, is that NATO is not a charitable uh, organization. It is a part where you have to play your part. You have to be ready. You have to be supportive. You need to understand how it works. And there are other ways to uh, group people with us through the Partnership for Peace and a number of different ways where people, where countries can be uh, put kind of on a plan when they're ready to be members of NATO. But I think that the expansions that we've had thus far have been very, very good. And I applaud the expansion of NATO and understanding what its uh, strategic concept is. And by the way, just to tell you how life changes, I had been asked uh, at the 60th anniversary to do uh, with a group of experts, a new strategic concept for NATO. And at that time, what was happening was all of NATO's activities were out of area, that is, in countries that were not members of NATO. Now, there are countries that are um, members of NATO that have been under threat. And so the NATO concept is something that has to be fluid and flexible to do uh, what the right mandates are. Related question, how do we rebuild trust with our allies in Europe? Well, that is going to be one of the major activities, I think, because uh, in the last four years, um, our relationships have deteriorated because there has been an unpredictability and a, um, and in many ways, frankly, uh, that uh, the United States has been absent. Um, I, the last time I left the country was actually uh, almost a year ago in March at the Munich Security Conference. And it was evident that the US was kind of a joke that people weren't paying attention to us. So there is going to be a lot of work. I do think that uh, President Biden and the team is uh, very well suited to um, reintroducing us in a number of ways and understanding that it is a partnership um, with the Europeans, not Americans dominating, and that we really need to figure out how to, I've often told the story that after the end of World War II, Europe was like sick children who were willing to take any medicine that the US was offering. Then and we went through the EU, what I call um, the teenage years, when in fact, um, the, a lot of the Europeans said, where's my allowance? I don't wanna do that chore. And what we need now is to develop an adult relationship where we respect each other and are able to cooperate in areas where we have something in common. And 
it's going to take a listening tour. It's going to take humility. And it's going to take a way of understanding that we need to reintroduce ourselves. So a question from one of our students is, first off, uh, praising you for helping to chair the Genocide Prevention Task Force. But then looking forward, how do you think democracies can best work to prevent ongoing or future genocide? Well, I think that um, the important part is how to prevent extremism in fragile states. Um, another task force I worked on at USIP. And, um, and I really do think that we need to be more aware of what is going on in other countries. One of the things that um, uh, you know, one could say, I wouldn't, but one could say that we didn't know what was going on during World War II. Um, and uh, as there has been more information, we do know what goes on in other countries. And a lot of what we were able to do in the Balkans during the Clinton administration was because we knew that ethnic cleansing was taking place. We now know everything that's going on everywhere. And I think that the issue is how to prevent the kinds of things that uh, lead to genocide uh, or ethnic cleansing, which is this exacerbation of differences and to keep track. I know that there's been this whole doctrine now of the responsibility to protect, which has had some criticism, but in many ways, the international community does have to pay attention so that the early signs of um, one identity hating another um, and hyper-nationalism is something that is viewed um, very early. And that's what has to happen. Uh, Secretary Pompeo, in one of his final acts as secretary, designated the situation, the plight of the Uyghurs in China as genocide. Agree? And uh, what difference does it make? Well, I think, if I, if I might, what is always complicated the United States is a signatory of the Genocide Convention, which requires you to take action. And I remember trying to understand when the legal uh, advisor at the State Department said that we had to call certain things acts of genocide rather than genocide uh, because uh, we weren't going to intervene. Um, I do think that one needs to figure out what it means these days, but I do think the kinds of things that the Chinese are doing to the Uyghurs um, are certainly genocidal acts um, and that we have to speak out. And I think that one of the things that is going to be very important and um, Tony Blinken has actually said there's going to be a, a review of a number of the uh, policies towards China and how that works. Um, and it has to be part of an overall policy, um, but of um, the various things that Secretary Pompeo said on his way out I think that was not the worst. <laughs> well, and that actually uh, points at another question that was asked. Uh, obviously, uh, diplomacy and policies and positions are not light switches going on and off. There are threads of a continuum. Uh, we heard some of it from Secretary Blinken in his testimony, but what aspects or policies, uh, innovations from the Trump administration do you think should be uh, held on to, or perhaps picked up and in, in refined, but not entirely discarded in the Biden administration? Well, I do think that um, it is important to um, understand our relationship with China. Uh, it is, um, I don't quite know whether, um, I mean, we've all, how many of us have been to one um, task force after another that deals with China? It has been a major, source of our um, uh, activities and interest of the rising power. And I think there are various parts of the policy towards China um, that does make sense in terms of uh, the things that are happening in the South China Sea and uh, a variety of ways that we actually need to be more alert to what is happening, in, not just among the Uyghurs, but in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Uh, but I also think that we need to have kind of what I call better statecraft in terms of the tools that we use with the Chinese. They are adversaries. There's um, no question about that. They're also competitors, which has a lot to do with what our various uh, trade laws are and 
um, entity lists and how various uh, parts of our government take that on. And then there are areas where we have to cooperate, um, which is in climate change um, and in and, I, and perhaps uh, belatedly in terms of dealing with the virus. Um, but I do think that um, there are parts that are worth keeping um, and understanding what the threats from China are. But I think also there needs to be a more, um, uh, I know people don't like this word nuanced or whatever way of a more complex way of dealing with the Chinese, but they are definitely in, um, in the minds of everybody um, and the way that they use their power. You know, they have their belt and road uh, policy. And I've been saying that the Chinese must be getting very fat because the belt keeps getting larger and larger. Um, and we have to watch what they're doing and not, um, not kind of let their overwhelming nationalism uh, and sense that they uh, are the wave of the future dominate everything that we're doing vis-a-vis -vis them. Uh, you use the word nuanced. I actually agree with you, and maybe it isn't a popular uh, term. It certainly is, in some ways, emotionally more satisfying to poke each other in the eye, but doesn't seem to really advance the cause. And I think that that's perhaps uh, the challenge that Secretary Blinken has uh, on his portfolio on his desk is figuring out how you hit that nuance. One question that was asked, and I know it's an exceptionally thorny issue with respect to US-China relations, and that's Taiwan. Uh, how um, do you see the current state of affairs, well, not just with Taiwan, but US, Taiwan, China, uh, and how do we address that in the most effective way for our interests, as well as broader causes of democracy and, and freedom? Well, uh, let me just say, I was in the White House when uh, the, uh, the normalization of the Chinese relationship during the Carter administration and the setting forth of our relationship with Taiwan through the Taiwan Relations Act. And we do have certain obligations towards Taiwan in terms of arms sales and a variety of aspects. Uh, we do not have uh, diplomatic representation, but we have an institute and various ways that we can connect. Uh, I do think what is interesting is that um, the uh, Taiwanese have had a democratic government um, and that um, um, President Biden, that there was a Taiwanese representative that was invited to the inauguration. I think that uh, what is of great concern are the hostile acts by the mainland Chinese in terms of uh, flyovers and dangerous things. Uh, last night I was at um, an event or yesterday afternoon with Henry Kissinger. And so it does make me think back to the Shanghai communiques and our one China policy. Uh, and I think it is worth understanding that. By the way, uh, I have often said that going to meet with the Chinese with Henry Kissinger is like going with a demigod. And somebody said, leave out the demi. Um, uh, he is viewed as the uh, obvious, the authority on it. I think that we want to have peaceful change, but we also have to be very vigilant about the kinds of things that are going on. And to go back to the policy, what we haven't had are enough channels of communication with the Chinese. Uh, in order to avoid accidents uh, over in the Taiwan Straits and a variety of other places in the South China Sea. But Taiwan is clearly a major issue and it's a major issue in terms of technology and the things that they produce that are used um, uh, throughout our technological life. And so I do think that dealing with Taiwan and China is going to be a major aspect of uh, the Biden foreign policy. We are running out of time, but uh, last quick question, can't be answered quickly, I suspect. Uh, how do you see the future of US-Bosnia relations? Goodness. Um, well, uh, <laughs> uh, I think, um, I have to say that uh, I did spend an awful lot of time on the Balkans and Bosnia. And because my life is such a crazy accident, I was born in Czechoslovakia. My father was a 
a professional diplomat, and he was the Czechoslovak ambassador to Yugoslavia after the war. So of uh, various languages that I can get through, Serbian is and uh, Serbo-Croatian and understanding that area and understanding all the different relationships and the fact that I spent so much time on Bosnia. I think um, we need to figure out how to work with them in terms of a very complicated uh, political system that they have, um, which has three prime ministers and a very complex government and that the ethnic, we had seen it as a multi-ethnic state, but it is con that continues to be undermined in a number of different ways, uh, primarily by Belgrade and Republika Srpska. But I think we need to work uh, with them, the Bosnians, a variety of ways to kind of mitigate some of the issues that are still out there. And one of the things, frankly, Mark, is that Americans have this uh, way that we operate, which is we deal with the problem and we put a check mark by it, think it's done. Something as complicated as what was going on in the former Yugoslavia, Bosnia specifically, you need to continue to pay attention to it. And it does also need uh, more uh, input from our allies in a number of different ways. It is not solved. The Dayton Accords created a lot of uh, the problems and everything needs to be kind of updated. Uh, but I hope that all the work that has gone into Bosnia uh, will in fact uh, come to positive fruition, but it is not easy at this point to, that's an understatement, a nuanced understatement. <laughs> Madeline, you just made reference to the need to pay attention. The good news for all of us is you have been and continue to be paying attention to the great challenges facing the U.S. in terms of diplomatic challenges and American leadership. Uh, I enjoy every conversation we have. Thanks to you for your time, your leadership, uh, your regards. And uh, I hope this has been a good session for everyone. The struggle for democracy and one of the champions of democracy, Secretary Madeleine Albright. And Thank Mark, you. it's great yeah. to be with you and good luck on your next life. And the pin I have on today is one that was uh, a Woodrow Wilson Institute pin that Jane Harmon gave me. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Secretary thank Albright, you. thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. And Mark Green, thank you for a terrific job of, of handling that session. We will see you again tomorrow morning uh, with Peter Baker and Susan Glasser. So thanks very much. Uh, and we're going to take another quick break uh, before we come back to our last session of the day. And that is with Congressman Ted Deutsch and Congressman Adam Kinzinger. So be back at three o'clock for that session. Thank you. As a student who is interested in looking to go into politics in the future, having the experience of State of the World is one of the best things that we can get. So at this event, we will see panelists throughout the two days from all walks of life. There are journalists, there are scholars, there are actual diplomats themselves and they discuss prevalent issues to today's international communities. Human trafficking is now part of the conversation. Our original response on the 29th of December to their rocket attacks on us on the 27th of December was absolutely justifiable and right under international law. I don't think that if you talk to any Democrat, they would tell you that impeachment was good politics for them. This is an experience that students don't get on a daily basis because despite the fact that you can learn a lot in classes and in lectures, you can't experience having a real-life policymaker, a real-life scientist there in front of you explaining to you the intricacies of these foreign situations and conflicts. You, you assemble such an amazing group of people here um, that it's become this sort of meeting place early in the new year. So it's to really become the first conference of the new year. State of the world proves that every concept we learn in poli-sci courses, in international relations courses, in any one of those social sciences, how they are applicable to real day issues and events that we are seeing. Hopefully when you leave here today, you'll be enabled to have an even louder voice than you already have. I think you've really established something uh, here at FIU uh, that you should be very proud of.